After the mass shooting in El Paso, his father offered the explanation that the shooter didn't have many friends. This morning, I'd like to speak with you about social isolation and its effect on individuals and on American political life. Then I'll offer some thoughts on what we as faithful people might do about it. When living in Washington and a member of St. Albans Parish, I had the responsibility of taking communion to shut-ins. Some were elderly women in apartment buildings on Connecticut Avenue whose loved ones had long since died or moved away. Their caregivers, if any, were disengaged. One was asleep on the living room sofa. When I left their apartments, I had the impression that no one else would be there until my return. My experience wasn't unique. A recent study says that 43% of older people feel lonely. It affects their health. 59% of lonely elderly have a greater risk of decline than those who aren't alone. 45% have a greater risk of death. How about millennials, people between the ages of 23 and 38? 30% report feeling lonely, 22% say they have no friends at all, zero. This is sad and it has consequences, at least the father of the El Paso shooter thinks it does, and it stands to reason. When we don't see others as friends, we see them as objects, perhaps to be resented, perhaps to be cast aside or even shot. In Washington, the absence of friendship has political consequences. Some members of Congress sleep in their offices. Their families are back in the district. They haven't been in each other's homes. They don't know colleagues as husbands or wives or parents. They only know them as political allies or opponents. One senator told me that he couldn't think of five others he would invite to his house for dinner. Social interaction, the lubricant that makes politics work, is gone. And Congress, where policy is supposed to be made, is dysfunctional. Many Americans are concerned. They see what's wrong and long to fix it. A year ago, I wrote an opinion piece about my friendship with, my Sen with, my friendship with Senator Tom Eagleton. He a Democrat, I a Republican. Our offices had a joint softball team called the Missouri Compromise. The point of the piece was that we should treat political opponents as friends, not enemies. I have never received a more positive response to anything I have written. That's what people want politics to be, but it's not what politics has become. After the 2016 election, some families did not share Thanksgiving dinner. 33% of college students blocked or unfriended on social media people who voted the wrong way. Social media is not a place for true friendship, but the point is that 33% of college students were saying, because I don't like your politics, I don't want to be your friend. A year ago, a law school that prides itself on civility came apart during the confirmation hearing of Brett Kavanaugh. First-year students attacked each other personally. 
A longtime professor explained the uproar this way. The Kavanaugh hearing occurred at the beginning of the academic year. First year students had just arrived. They were strangers to one another. With the Kavanaugh controversy, they knew each other politically before they could know each other personally. Had it been the other way around, they would have been more, more civil. There's a word that's recently gained a lot of currency, tribal. You see it all the time. It's isolation by group. Amy Chua has written a book called Political Tribes. Here, in a nutshell, is her point. Everyone in America today feels threatened. African Americans fear that their children will be shot by police. Mexicans are threatened with deportation. Muslims are told their religion should be barred from the country. Women are abused by workplace predators. Poor whites feel left behind by a country that calls them trash. Religious conservatives are threatened by popular culture. Amy Chua notes that when people feel threatened, they retreat into tribalism. They see outsiders as the enemy. Not long ago, inclusivity was a great liberal value. In 2004, Barack Obama expressed this well. He said, there's not a black America and white America and Latino America and Asian America. There's the United States of America. That lofty principle has given way to identity politics. The claim is that if you aren't one of us, you don't understand what it is to be us. In current parlance, you're not woke. Even worse, you are complicit in a rigged, oppressive system. On college campuses, boycotts and, violent, boycotts and violence greet speakers. The rationale is, if I don't agree with you, I don't have to listen to you. Left-wing tribalism leads to Newton's third law, equal and opposite reaction in the form of right-wing tribalism. People who have been berated as bigots respond in kind. We are tribal, divided, and enraged. The media stirs up this rage. It grows ratings. So do politicians. It wins elections. And that's where we are in America today. So what might people of faith do to bring change, to bring America together? Well, one possibility is that we find someone else to do our work for us, an organization or a program that could combat loneliness and isolation. An Episcopal priest once told me that he had never attended a clergy conference that didn't end with resolutions to write Congress. That's at least something, but it's not enough. Jesus didn't tell us to find someone else to do the work of loving our neighbors. He didn't say we should search for a program that would reach out to our enemies. Jesus directed the love commandment to you and me. We have been given a non-delegable responsibility. The question is what you and I as people of faith are going to do. Another possibility is that we focus our energies on grand social principles, even when the pursuit of our causes means hurting real people. 
In our righteous zeal, we turn decent individuals into villains. Here's an example of demonizing people in the name of principle. I live in St. Louis, about 10 miles from Ferguson, a community that gained notoriety a few years ago when a white police officer shot a black teenager. Without knowing the facts of the specific case, many religious groups felt called upon to condemn police brutality and champion racial justice. With media coverage, interfaith clergy marched on the Ferguson police station and humiliated individual police officers, demanding that the officers repent of supposed misconduct. The clergy thought that their cause gave them license to accuse people they had never met of racist acts. They confused a righteous cause, racial justice, with the presumed guilt of individuals. Instead of confronting those police officers as if they were evil and in need of public repentance, a better and more pastoral approach would have presumed that the officers were good and tried to encourage that goodness. If neither delegation nor confrontation is sufficient, what could we do? How might faithful people overcome the isolation that afflicts America today. For starters, our model could be a regular practice in this and many churches, exchanging the peace. During our worship, we turn to one another, often total strangers, extend a hand and say, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Suppose we didn't confine exchanging the peace to our sanctuaries. Suppose it became our gift to a broken nation that needs us. Suppose we exchanged the peace with our neighbors. Suppose we exchanged the peace in politics. We wouldn't do in the outside world exactly what we do in church. We wouldn't say, the peace of the Lord be always with you. In a secular setting, we might simply say, I am your friend. What a difference we would make in changing the tone of politics. Let's try an experiment. Picture someone you can't stand. It might be a hot-tempered neighbor or an obnoxious personality on Fox News or CNN. Now go up to that person, put out your hand and say, I am your friend. What have you done? You have changed the culture. This could be our ministry to America. We could make it our business to treat differing people, even enemies, certainly political opponents, as friends. Amy Chua gives some examples of how this might work. She tells of Unitarians and Bosnian Muslims who watched the Super Bowl together in Utica, New York. In Hackettstown, New Jersey, after the 2016 election, people on both sides came together just to be with each other. They adopted a slogan, Make America Relate Again. If people in Utica, New York, and Hackettstown, New Jersey can find creative ways to overcome isolation, why can't we do the same? Here in Washington, you could invite political opponents and their families to break bread together. Where members of Congress sleep in their offices and senators can only think of a handful of colleagues to invite for dinner, you could be the icebreaker. 
this great cathedral could become a place not to fight over contentious issues, but, but to get to know opponents as human beings. Wherever you live in America, Washington, St. Louis, wherever, you can change this nation's culture. It's hard to imagine if you're right on top of government and to see it in operation every day, but most Americans aren't waiting with bated breath for the latest policy to come their way from Washington. And most aren't fixated every hour of every day on the next election. They long for a culture in which they see each other as neighbors and treat each other as friends. We can create that culture. It is a ministry for the faithful, for us who are commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. It would be an ambitious ministry. It would reach beyond the personal salvation of our own souls and extend to our communities and our nation. It would call for our dedication, imagination, and persistence. I offer no detailed plan on how we might proceed. It would need to, we would need to develop specific tactics along the way. What would work best at any time and place would be for us to decide. With a bit of thought, we will find countless ways in countless situations to exchange the peace. What is essential in the first instance is for us as people of faith to take responsibility for healing America. If we are not the ones to take on this responsibility, then who else will do it? We alone are under God's commandment to love our neighbor. No one else has such a God-given duty. Having received God, this God-given responsibility, let's get about the work of meeting it. This is no time to be passive. America needs us, God calls us.